Okay. Welcome, everybody. I, I think let's um, let's get things going. I am Howard Louth, and I'm director of the Center for Austrian Studies, and we're we're delighted to welcome you to our 35th annual Robert Kahn lecture. Um, Robert Kahn, for whom the uh, the lecture is named, was a uh, a very a preeminent historian of the Habsburg world. I believe there's a little biography of him, a little uh, sketch of his of his life on on the back of your program. I don't need to really sort of review it. He studied jurisprudence in, in Vienna. He uh, was an emigre, came to the United States. He switched tracks and studied history at Columbia University, where he earned his PhD, and then ultimately um, had a very successful career uh, teaching history at Rutgers University. Uh, he ended his career back in, in, in Vienna as a, as a visiting professor at um, the University of Vienna. Now, one thing that we're absolutely delighted and thrilled to have today is we have a sort of a, a, um, a connection to that Kahn uh, legacy. We have Marilyn Kahn and her, her husband, Neil, have um, come to us from, um, from sunny and warm um, <laughs> California to be with us today. So, so thank you, um, Marilyn and, and Neil, for, for joining us. Uh, I would also like to sort of point out, we also have two former directors of the Center for Austrian Studies with us. We have uh, Professor David Good and Professor Gary Cohen. So thank you both David and, and Gary uh, for being with us today. Now we are very, um, we're very, very fortunate to have our, our, our speaker uh, today. Um, our speaker today is Professor Barbara Stolberg Rillinger, who uh, began her uh, intellectual and academic career at the University of, of Cologne, where she started uh, studying German literature, language, history, and art history. So already, I think, at, at a formative stage of, of study, uh, sort of. Wonderful sort of intellectual ferment was 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 developing. Uh, she then continued um, as the uh, as the, the chair professor at the University of Munster in early modern history, and then just two years ago uh, was called to Berlin, uh, where she has ascended as the director of one of the premier institutions for uh, research institutions for the study of the uh, humanities and social sciences. The, Wissenschaftsschule in, in Berlin. Uh, Professor Stolberg Rillinger has, has focused, her work has focused on the, the political and cultural history of, of Central Europe with a specific focus on the, on, on, on the, on the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, the list of her accolades and her publications are far too long for me to, to go into. I can just mention a, a few of them that she uh, won the uh, very prestigious Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz <laughs> Award, and then not too long ago, uh, just two years ago, a little bit closer to Vienna, the Sigmund Freud Prize. Uh, she's the author, as I said, of a, a sort of very long list of publications. Let me just very briefly highlight three. Um, she is the author of a short history of the Holy Roman Empire, which I highlight as it was, it's been recently translated and published by Princeton University Press, is a very nice entryway into, into the Holy Roman Empire. I have, in fact, I have a colleague who has adopted it as a course book uh, for her course next, next, next spring. Um, so highly recommended as a, as a way into that, into that world. But if you want to get more of a taste of how she looks at history and her, her methodology, I would also recommend the Emperor's Old Clothes, which, as the title might suggest, is a very interesting look at the culture, the political culture, of, of, of the empire, looking specifically at political ritual. Now, a little bit closer to home and what we're talking about today is her very new biography of Maria Theresa. Um, unfortunately, it's not quite out in English, but it will be, and I'm actually quite impressed with a number um, in our audience, including the cons who have um, come here all, all the way to California, not only, you know, fearing that, with no fear of the cold, but bringing the biography along through it and working through the German. Uh, I know that there's some other students as well who have worked through the text as well, so 
um, you have a, an audience of people who have actually worked with the book too, as well. We're very pleased with that. So today we will be zooming in on Maria Theresa and and considering uh, the myths of Laurie, Maria Theresa, of how she is considered, how she how how that has evolved and changed over time. So without any further ado, let me turn the podium over to our our guest today. So welcome very much. Thank you very much, Howard. Thank you for your hospitality here in the Center for Austrian Studies. I would like to say that it is not only a pleasure, but a great honor for me to give this annual lecture in honor of Robert Kahn, especially because he is one of the hundreds of intellectuals who were expelled from Austria or Germany uh, and uh, were received in the US. And I must say that German academia has never recovered from this dramatic brain drain. And uh, Robert Kahn is just one example that shows how much the United States owe to the immigrants. I would like to start with uh, directing your attention to these three uh, covers, title covers, um, and you will immediate, immediately uh, see that there are obvious commonalities. <laughs> and I'm sure that this is neither just a fad nor a, a, a coincidence. On each of these covers, you see the portrait of the respective figure is only uh, partly seen. And for me, this perfectly symbolizes um, a specific skeptical view of biogra biogra biographical writing. Because as a biographer, these cover pictures seem to say, as a biographer, you never get the whole picture of a person. It's always up to the author to not only to choose the material, but also to establish a certain narrative structure. Uh, biography doesn't simply tell itself. There's always more than one true story about uh, such a figure. As the Swiss historian Valentin Gröbner nicely put it, um, the past is a big, untidy cellar. It is a bit damp and dark and smells a bit strange there. We go down and get what we want. So what you choose and how you arrange it, which story you tell, depends, of course, depends on which perspective you take and what you are interested in. In the case of famous heroic figures like uh, the Empress Queen Maria Theresia, it's not just the abundance of sources that you have to cope with, but also the imaginations that have been entwined around this figure for more than two centuries in this case. So when dealing with Maria Theresia, you are inevitably dealing with a myth. And in my biography, I uh, try to call this myth into question. As you know, Maria Theresia was the icon of the Austrian state, or you should rather say several different states of the 19th and 20th centuries. Her, her image has been shaped by two impressive monuments. One is, you may know that, one is this gigantic bronze monument in, uh, on Vienna Primstraße, erected in 1888. And the other is a written monument. Um, the uh, famous uh, ten-volume biography by Alfred Ritter von Arnim, the director of the state, Austrian State Archives, a biography ten volumes pu published between 1863 and 1879. Arnim, by the way, was also the one who created the program for the Ringstraße monument. So. While the two monuments were under construction, the Habsburg monarchy was losing its former greatness little by little. And in this situation, contempt contemplating past crises that had been heroically overcome could convey hope and a sense of orientation for the future. Both memorials to Maria Theresia, the one in bronze and the one in paper, are perfect <coughs> examples of monumental history in the sense of Friedrich Nietzsche's famous 
second untimely meditation on the use and abuse of history from 1874. History writing is monumental in his terminology if it places the past in the service of present day hopes and expectations. History is a means against resignation, he wrote. He wrote. It teaches that the greatness that once existed had been possible and may thus be possible again, end of quote. Monumental history in the sense of Nietzsche, however, must flatten out the differences between past and present. And again, a quote, the individuality of the past has to be forced into a general form and all its sharp angles and lines broken to pieces, end of quote. And that is exactly what the classic narrative about the Empress did. Two 19th century monuments have shaped this narrative about Maria Theresia ever since. 19th century monumental history is blocking a sober view of the Empress. There are some obvious reasons why Maria Theresia was the ideal object of monumental history. The classical narrative about her was like a fairy tale plot. This plot in short, goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful young princess who inherited an enormous empire that was in a state of ruin, and she was attacked on all sides by evil enemies. To persuade it, a horde of wild but noble warriors to help her, and with their support, defended <coughs> the throne of her ancestors. Three times she came up against her most perfidious opponent, fought for her most valuable province. She lost this province, but her defeat became her victory, for it was only thanks to this ordeal that she managed to disempower her father's resentful old advisors and thereby join forces with clever young men to turn her ailing empire into a modern state. When surrounded by her many children and loved by all, all her subjects and even by the lowest of her subjects, she closed her eyes forever and not even her worst enemy could deny her his protection. This is how the story was told since the middle of the 19th century at least and how it is sometimes still told, for example, in the recent docudrama of the Austrian Public Broadcasting Co Corporation, ORF, um, which you see here, this story uh, of course, this story isn't completely untrue, but it is highly selective, to say the least. What made Maria Theresia an extraordinary source of fascination for uh, almost exclusively male historians was her specific mixture of masculine heroism and feminine virt virtue. She was known not only as an empress, but also as a faithful wife and mother of 16 children. Sensational fecundity combined with virile leadership, female and male perfection in a single person made Maria Theresia an exceptional figure, even when compared with other famous female rulers, rulers like, uh, for example, Cleopatra, Elizabeth I, Catherine II of Russia, whatever. Whereas these other monarchs were either unmarried or childless, or sexually promiscuous, or all at once, Maria Theresia alone united wise governance, conjugal fidelity, impeccable morals, and teeming fecundity. She appeared, in other words, to be the, an exception even among exceptions. But, note that well, uh, point is, as a female monarch, she was the great exception that didn't question the rule, namely politics is a male business, but rather the exception that proves the rule, for a rule only properly takes uh, shape when it is transgressed, provided that the exception remains just that an exception. As an exceptional woman, Maria Theresia posed no threat to the established gender roles, on the contrary. For Maria Theresia, her, her gentleman admirers of the 19th and 20th centuries wrote, um, she did not rule by abstract reasoning. She acted naively based on her feminine intuition 
with a heart better educated than her head, ever the loving, caring mother characterized by winning goodness and a certain need for support, and so on. Always letting her mind follow her heart, and so on and so forth. The quote uh, could be um, multiplied uh, at will. In a highly influential panegyric written for the 200th birthday, uh, in Maria Theresa's 200th birthday in 1917, and we printed in 1980 uh, in a volume on the 200th anniversary of her death, Hugo von Hofmannsthal finally catapulted her into the sphere of the supernatural and elevated her to a mythical figure. He took the title Magna Mata Austria, literally, as attributing to her a kind of political childbearing capacity. And he wrote, for Hugo von Hofmannsthal, the demonically maternal side of her was decisive. She transferred her capacity to animate a body, to bring into the world a being through, with, through whose veins flows the sensation of life and unity onto the part of the world that had been entrusted to her. In other words, she bore the modern state as she bore her 16 children, being literally the loving mother of her land, as she called herself once in her so-called political testimony process of, of state building appeared as parturition, the Habsburg complex of territories as an animate being that owed its life to the maternal ruler. It goes without saying that this narrative was shaped by the classical gender dichotomy, ideally represented by Maria Theresia on the one hand and Frederick the Great of Prussia on the other. This master narrative Frederick II stood in relation to Maria Theresia as mind to heart, enlightenment to tradition, sterility to fertility, cold rationality to maternal warmth, and so on and so forth. Um, Austrian culture was feminine, Prussian, masculine. In short, everything fitted harmoniously into the eternal antagonism It is this persisting narrative of Maria Theresia that a biography today has to deal with. But as I said in the beginning, the traditional story shaped by 19th century historians is not, of course, not simply wrong. And it would be naive to believe that we could now simply tell a correct story. At best, we can tell a somewhat more distant, more skeptical story, or I would rather say we should tell different stories from different perspectives and try to understand how this myth came about in the first place. So today I want to deal with one crucial element of her myth, probably the most crucial one that encompasses all the other elements, namely that she loved her people more than her own children and was loved by her subjects in return, gladly lending an ear to the lowest of her subjects, even to the lowest. Alfred von Arnit, her biographer, referring to Voltaire, put it this way, I quote, the magic of her personal demeanor, the heart-winning way that she met everybody, the unrestricted access to her, the evident amount of time that she spent listening to the pleas and complaints of the lowest of her subjects and trying to give comfort and help all this won her the great admiration of everyone who came close to her, end of quote. This specific combination of loving maternity and general accessibility, love of her subjects and love of her children, was perfectly reflected by a popular legend of the 19th century, which is represented by this beautiful picture that uh, was the illustration of a legend uh, and uh, published in a popular family journal called Die Gartenlaube. Um, and the, the legend reads, walking through the park of Schönbrunn, Maria Theresia once came across a sleeping beggar woman with a weeping baby. You see the beggar woman uh, on the left, dressed in black. 
with a weeping, weeping baby, and she did not hesitate to appease the child by personally breastfeeding it. So the baby she is breastfeeding is not her own child, but the beggar's child. Of course, this story is absolutely bizarre. It is a complete anachronism, for Maria Theresia didn't even breastfeed her own children, none of her <laughs> And she also um, told her daughter not to do that when it became modern in, um, uh, when, when Rousseau ma made this um, popular. Um, it is all the more telling, this legend and this uh, picture, because it takes her myth literally being a loving mother to all of her subjects, even and especially the lowest, as the model of the ideal motherhood would have it in the, in the 19th century. But breastfeeding is, of course, not uh, uh, what aristocrats did in the 18th century. Now, the idea of the monarch being the loving father, respectively mother, of their subjects obviously is a very old traditional topic. Historians cannot look into the hearts and minds of the individuals to find, um, to find out if they really loved Maria Theresia and vice versa, whatever that might mean, love in this case. Nor do, we, nor do we have opinion polls that would have measured the ups and downs of Maria Theresia's popular popularity as we have today. We can only analyze the emotional rhetoric of the time. And we can try to reconstruct how the actual communication between ruler and subject was like. So in the following, I'm trying to answer two questions, basically. First, as for the alleged accessibility, even for the lowest subjects, which forms of communication actually existed between the empress and her uh, subjects? When and where did they personally meet? each other and how did they behave to each other? And second, what was the legend of love and accessibility based on in her specific case? How did Maria Theresia's charismatic reputation emerge? So as for the first question, the general accessibility of the empress was a topos, uh, not only in the 19th century, but also in her own time. Listening and responding to everyone's concerns was, as I said, a very old topos, indicator and a symbol of a good ruler. But a closer look at the sources shows that the topos of Maria Theresia giving access even to the lowest subjects cannot at all be taken literally. On the contrary, in fact, she restricted the rules of access to her court even more than her predecessors had done. In general, the invisible barriers that kept common people from the court were so obvious that they hardly needed to be made explicit. Entry to the court on various occasions was governed to small, the smallest detail and carefully structured hierarchically by formal entry arrangements. For example, uh, this is one of the formal occasions. <laughs> common people did not even appear in these ceremonial regulations. And the orders, the statutes, spoke of everybody, jeder Mann, or tout le monde, that always meant everybody of rank, jeder Mann von Stand. And when mention was made of access for low people, since low is obviously a relative term, what this usually meant was access for, at lowest, counselors Geheimräte, doctors, and other so-called half nobles. In 1753, Maria Theresia placed new restrictions uh, on public audiences, even stricter than before. People could no longer be placed on the audience list unless they had obtained signature from the Lord Chamberlain. Maria Theresia also instilled that later among her adult, adult children, when they led their own courts, quote, Maria Theresia's own words, it is in no way appropriate that anyone and everyone may appear in your court. 
She sends her children exact lists of people to whom they should uh, grant access and admonish them to receive the high nobles and earn them once or twice every week with the ex express purpose of giving them the opportunity to do something for their family. The common people were treated quite differently. Personnel at the Viennese court were instructed first to tell the guards to hold back the invasion of eager common people at court festivals and court functions. Even in great dynastic rituals, when the ruling family joined together with the people to stage both head and body of the realm as a ritual community, the people were usually represented by estates and corporations. The crowd was excluded from the palace, their ceremonial role being reduced to watching and applauding the ritual parade in the streets. Court, however, traditionally involved common people as objects of the sovereign's grace in the mode of a symbolic pass pro toto. With exceptional, exceptional acts of personal charity, the rulers presented themselves as loving parents of all their subjects. <coughs> the most spectacular example was the traditional public washing of feet on Maundy Thursday in front of the assembled court society. Empress and Emperor would kneel to wash and kiss the feet of 12 poor old men and women and serve them symbolically, following, of course, the example of Jesus um, at the Last Supper, which is still observed today, for example, by the Pope, as you may know. However, the individual subjects were carefully selected, washed, and given clothes to wear before the imperial couple went to serve them with golden basins and lace trimmed linen cloths. Nothing was actually eaten of the food that was dished up, and it is not clear if the feet were even wetted. The whole event, event was an impressive staging of humility and charity as cardinal virtues of a Christian ruler. It was a ritual of symbolic inversion. There was, however, another medium that people could use to be heard by the ruler, a medium that was supposed to be open to uh, literally to all subjects, namely the supplication. Subjects sought the empress's support not only with requests for favors, but also with complaints, especially when they felt being treated unfairly by their lords or local officials. According to the, to the traditional concept of rule, a good monarch had to provide refuge to his subjects against the injustice of lower authorities, since only the monarch, him or herself, was deemed to be above all partiality, committed only to the common good. Those groaning under the arbitrariness of their lord or local officials desperately wished to believe in the maternal grace of the supposedly acceptable and gentle sovereign. Maria Theresia, however, did all she could to disencourage her subjects from taking the road to the court. She repeatedly gave commands to the intermediate authorities, quote, to warn the subjects about the journey to Vienna. As is well known, she initiated an ambitious series of administrative reforms. Subjects should always first address their complaints to their landlords, then to the newly established district office, Kreisämter, then to the new regional government, Repräsentationen und Kammern, as they were called, and only then to the court. But it turned out that the subjects were unwilling to go through this formal process that was long, expensive, and unpredictable, and especially so if it was the authorities themselves that were the source <coughs> of injustice. Maria Theresia therefore ordered expressly that the lower authorities give a certificate to everyone who complained. By this, those subjects who made their way, their way to Vienna anyway should be able to prove that they had already complained at every level of the hierarchy. However, to certify that was hardly in the interest of the public officials, since to do so 
would have meant issuing a certificate of their own creation. So we are still lacking detailed research on how these, uh, how the subjects um, made use of the new administrative procedures, but it seems that um, the new procedures made it even more difficult uh, than before for simple subjects to reach the rule of reason. Paradoxically though, that did not affect Maria Theresia's, Maria Theresia's fabulous reputation. On the contrary, the more unreliably the authorities worked, the more unshakable remained the subject's confidence in the gracious sovereign herself. It was highly improbable that this confidence be subjected to a reality check. So it was exactly her remoteness in her distant residence that protected Maria Theresia from being held personally responsible for grievances and the administrative reforms even reinforced that mechanism. And we, um, historians call this naive monarchism, uh, a phenomenon that is not completely unknown, I would say, um, until today. <coughs> However, it actually happened now and then that daredevil subjects with a particularly urgent concern would lie in wait for the empress in order to throw themselves at her feet on her way to uh, the ch public service, church service, for example, or uh, on her way on her, on her rides, on her promenades <coughs> to the park, of Schönbrunn at public theater uh, performances, and so on. So occasions where the boundaries between courtly and urban space were permeable. This happened, for example, when Maria Theresia had issued the order in winter 1744-45 uh, to expel all the Jews without exception from the city of Prague, about 20,000 persons in the middle of winter. Numerous intercessions, even by the most powerful patrons, including even the Pope, failed. So one particularly bold member of the Jewish community in his desperation waylaid the empress in the street and begged for her, for her for, more, for mercy, and that was in vain. Another dramatic example is the case of a group of desperate, desperate peasants' wives from Styria trying to beg mercy for their husbands who had been imprisoned and even tortured by their landlords. In cases like this, the supplicants were not only rejected, but even arrested, sometimes locked up, uh, either in prison or in hospital, or even deported to Transylvania. <clears throat> there was yet another significant exception how simple subjects could uh, gain access to the empress as objects of amusement of the court society. In the sources, there are many stories about common people being presented at court in the mode of ridicule. The most telling one is the story um, of Peter Posch, a poor orphan from Tyrol who traveled around southern German courts and more or less involuntarily played the court jester at a time when uh, that was already becoming an anachronism and was no longer in line with enlightenment. In his autobiography, Posh described his success at the Viennese court as a parody of a classic courtly career. And in this narrative, Maria Theresia plays the role of a fairy queen, appearing to the poor boy in a dream that is coming true in the end. So in the end, he, is, uh, he has an audience uh, at Maria Theresia. He, the lowest of all subjects, as he calls himself, gets access to the court where the gentle empress treats him like her own son, and he meets her in a mode of social reciprocity. The crucial point of this story is that the jester could allow himself to meet the ruler on eye level, as it were, because it was precisely by doing so that he proved himself a jester. So to sum up, it's beyond doubt that Maria Theresia sought to keep any direct contact with the common people at bay as far as possible. People from the lower ranks 
could only appear legitimately at court in three different roles, as servants or as recipients of symbolic charity, pars pro totum, or as objects of amusement. So this being said, the question is, how could that myth of Maria Theresia's general accessibility emerge? And what made it so resistant against empirical falsification? What was Maria Theresia's charisma based on? The German pamphlet of 1745 was titled, Why is the Queen of Hungary, Maria Theresia, so extraordinarily loved? The anonymous, anonymous author attributed this to her being a woman and a mother, more precisely, an exceptionally beautiful young woman. Quote, the excitement of a fete is the greatest art in its day, whereby kings can preserve everything. A woman has the advantage over a man that her deeds make a greater impression in the mind. There is a more tender inclination against the beautiful sex. End of quote. According to the author, nature makes it easier for female rulers by their beauty and pleasing to win the minds of their, of their subject, subjects and to find pleasing. Thus, the contemporary, and even more so later historians, attributed it to Maria Theresia's youth, beauty, and femininity that she succeeded in winning the military help of the Hungarian nobles uh, in the war of Austrian succession, which threatened her uh, succession very deeply, um, through her personal address to the Hungarian Diet in 1741 very famous event. There she appeared as the embodiment of persecuted virtue, rightful royalty, and beauty. But later this story was re-narrated, painted, and printed innumerable times, including the latest docudrama of the Austrian television. And you, here you see just a small selection. There are innumerable um, paintings and uh, printings the helpless young mother defeats the wild Hungarian warriors with her beauty and provokes their chivalrousness uh, so that they come to her aid and save her empire. Thus, the picture stages a paradox, of course, the power of female weakness. But the scene did not take place as it is uh, de depicted here. The presence of the little heir to the throne on her arm was invented later uh, by Voltaire. The myth overgrew reality, and it is significant, of course, that she had uh, the little Joseph on her arm because the presence of this, this baby transformed this transformed the scene into um, or the, the, the picture in a, into a picture of Saint Mary, as it were. So, identifying the earthly queen with the heavenly queen, who was the patron saint of Austria, Magna Mater Austria. Almost everyone who set eyes on Maria Theresia in the first years of her reign, not just her admirers, remarked on her personal charm. To give just one example, the English ambassador wrote in 1753, quote, her person was made to wear a crown and her mind to give luster to it. Her countenance is filled with sense, spirit, and sweetness, and all her motions accompanied with grace and dignity. Even in 1755, when um, she, was, she had already given birth to 13 children and had put on considerable weight, the Prussian ambassador, so the ambassador of her enemy, uh, noted, the empress is one of the most beautiful princesses in Europe. She has a majestic yet friendly gaze. One does not approach her without a deep sense of admiration. And this uh, portrait was painted in 1762 by the famous Jean-Étienne Lyotard, um, and shows her at the age of 45. Doubtlessly, I think this is the most vivid and the most beautiful uh, and the least ceremonial, the least formal portrait of her. Um, so, uh, and it shows, really shows how she looked like in uh, uh, this age, age of 45. Descriptions of her beauty and charm had an almost topical character. It seems to be uh, her beauty uh, seemed to be a sign of her monarchical dignity and legitimacy as a tribute of her role as the empress. Now, 
Personal charisma is something that is not just aired, but also attributed. Both sides, the subjective and the objective side, are inextricably linked, as I would say. To understand how Maria, Maria Theresia's charisma works, it's helpful to have a closer look at records from visitors to Vienna who actually met her in person, visitors of the middle rank, such as, for example, the Mozarts or Lessing, um, who did not belong to the aristocratic court society, but recommended themselves to the ruler by exceptional works of art, literature, or scholarship. The public audiences that Maria, Maria Theresia granted to people uh, of their sort were highly valuable for them because, precisely because they were all they were always extraordinarily <laughs> favored. The route to the imperial audience followed an effective strategy of ceremonial escalation. And uh, if you uh, visit Schönbrunn and have a look at the uh, great gallery, you can imagine that this was the way uh, the visitors had to take, uh, an early part of the way, but you can imagine uh, what impression that made. Everything was designed to produce ambivalent feelings. With every threshold the visitors crossed, they felt more impressed and more intimidated, and yet more honored to have been personally chosen. Once they had gone through the long and complicated ceremonial procedures, they were surprised by the personal kindness of the actors. Usually Maria Theresia showed her visitors as many of her children as possible since there were the living guarantees, of course, of uh, dynastic continuity that had been threatened when Maria Theresia had uh, succeeded to the throne. Everyone had to pay their formal respects to all of the children present and to kiss their hands, even the, lit was the little, no, no, the smallest one, thereby paying demonstrative homage to the dynastic principle. That was a ceremonial um, in innovation Maria Theresia, which met with no small resistance of foreign ambassadors. Visitors of lower ranks, though, misinterpreted the empress displaying of her children as a sign of familial intimacy. Those who had expected solemn formality in the court's innermost center were surprised and enthusiastic. They felt personally singled out and almost inevitably became firm admirers of the empress. There's no doubt that Maria Theresia mastered the art of charming people to an extraordinary extent, and she did so consciously and strategically, as numerous letters, for example, to her children show very clearly. The more difficult it was to gain admittance to her, the greater was the effect of her charm to those who made it, and the stronger was their desire to let the whole world participate in their experience. Visitors of middle rank not only carried the Empress praise to the world, the Empress, not only the Empress praise to the world, but also and especially increased their own renown by this, of course. And this is the point where the exploding book market of the time comes into play. Since many of the, the visitors of, of middle rank had access to the increasing public sphere, to the book market, to the journals, and, and so on, the personal charisma of the Empress became widely known, and this effect then took on a dynamic of its own. Those who actually had personal access to the Empress could hope to enjoy all possible benefits, symbolic and material ones. The Viennese court was based, like all courts, on the fact that all kinds of goods, material and symbolic, were handed out there, and only there. Maria Theresa <coughs> certainly handed out plenty of both always on the basis of personal favor, generosity, and voluntariness, not, of course, on the basis of legal, abstract, general uh, legal claims. No one had formal right to the sovereign's favors. People could also leave without, with, with nothing. Maria Theresia doubtlessly mastered the art of distributing graces. She managed to keep expectations alive and to hold disappointments controllable. Those who were favored by Maria Theresia carried her praise out 
into the world, those who were not could still cope and therefore did not want to forfeit that chance through public ridicule. The vast majority of subjects who couldn't hope to ever meet the Empress Queen in person did encounter her in countless de depictions, uh, like this one, for example. Maria Theresia was probably the most portrait ruler of her time. She was the subject of around 100 large state format, st large format state portraits, like this one, and smaller ones like this, um, in addition to a num an untold number of copper plate engravings, miniatures, coins, me medals, and so on. The different genres of portraits served different ends and were tailored to different audiences. On the one hand, there were the great conventional state portraits from the uh, studio of a court painter, showing the sovereign resplendent in her jewelry and royal insignia. And putting rulership on display, uh, on display, these images had a representative function in the full sense of the word. They represented the absent sovereigns in governmental chambers, or courtrooms, and so on. Um, uh, they represented the, the absent sovereign uh, as such, and uh, the, 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 the figure on the picture had to be treated with the same deference as if she were uh, if there in person. Miniature copies of such portraits were applied to, uh, for example, tobacco boxes, to rings, and so on. This was a, a very uh, uh, common present also to foreign ambassadors and so on. Also beyond the court milieu, images of the empress were available for simple subjects. On pans, on tiles, uh, stove tiles like uh, there on the, on the left, um, like copper plates, medals, tableware, everything, um, for the better of, uh, and but also for everyone, very cheap copper plates, like these ones, uh, uh, broadsheet copper plates. It was not unusual even for peasants to have a portrait of the queen or of the imperial family uh, before their eyes on the wall or on the drinking vessels or whatever. Quote, the picture of the Queen of Hungary is honored <coughs> everywhere, a contemporary wrote. The court strategically pursued this politic of images, even um, arranging for portraits <coughs> of the imperial family to be, to be produced and sold to the public. The court organized um, this um, politic of images. The explicit intention was to stimulate feelings of love among subjects, quote, since arousing emotions is the greatest art in a state by which kings can contain, uh, can obtain such <coughs> So to conclude, it is beyond question that the topos of Maria Theresia's universal accessibility to the lowest subjects is a myth. Her court was just as socially exclusive as the other major European courts, if not more. In spite of this, her reputation was already legendary among her contemporaries. To explain that, it's not enough to point at her personal qualities, which she, of course, uh, owned, doubtlessly uh, owned, but also to the particular constellation and to the communicative structures of her time. The fact that the ruler was a woman and a mother, complying, at least in her youth, with all contemporary standards of beauty and female virtue, and ag against all expectations resisted the superiority of her enemies, this constellation was the basis of her almost magical reputation. And this reputation encouraged the common people to project their hopes and dreams on her. This especially worked with the simple subjects far away in the distant territory without any direct access to the court. The fact that Maria Theresia restricted the opportunity for subjects to present their concerns paradoxically even strengthened her general reputation as a universally accessible, impartial, and loving mother of the people. Second Magna Mater of Vienna. The more distant she was and the more otherworldly she appeared, 
the less she would disappoint expectations. So I would say she was a genuine fairy tale queen. In the capital, things look different though. After the Empress' death, 1780, public reactions in Vienna were much more ambivalent than the court had expected. In, the, in his memoirs, Duke, Al Duke Albert of Saxony, her son-in-law, described the shock felt by all those who had no known the Empress personally. But the common people, Lutzpupkindak, as he called them, greeted the funeral procession with scandalous indifference, as he wrote, with scandalous indifference. If her death marked for some the end of an epoch, for others it was the dawning of a new era. The journalist Johann Zetzel, for example, declared the year of her death to be the year of salvation, the boundary marker of the enlightened philosophical century. End of quote. In the revolutionary period around 1800, the Engli one English observer even reported that the fame of Maria Theresia had completely faded. Instead, it was her son Joseph II who became the hero of reformers and revolutionaries. They now condemned what Maria Theresia had been praised for. Sovereign generosity was now regarded as redistribution from the poor to the rich. Personal access to the monarch now appeared as superfluous, if not harmful, and suspicious of corruption. That changed again, as I said in the beginning, fundamentally and lastingly in the second half of the 19th century, when the new Austrian-Hungarian dual monarchy was established in it was Maria Theresia who was celebrated as the real ancestor of this peculiar new state. But this constitutional monarchy now no longer comprised subjects but citizens. And that is the reason why Maria Theresia was retrospectively depicted in an anti-courtly, anti-aristocratic uh, way. Her myth underwent reinvention. She was made into a bourgeois housewife, so to speak, a citizen queen. And I think it has been time to disenchant that myth, and I try to, to keep the heroine at arm's length, so to speak. Thank you very much for your... Could we move back to the three crowd? <laughs> Thank you very much. We're we'll back to the three crowds. I didn't get a chance to see that. You, you clicked it real fast. portrait with the, with the multiple the state portrait, it's got the crown of Hungary, the Holy Roman Empire, that one. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Good. Well, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Strobel Rielinga, for this uh, wonderful introduction into the world of Maria Theresa and how to think about issues of accessibility and myths and making of myths and making of images. So I'm sure that uh, you covered a lot of uh, different, a lot of material here, and I, I think it's a rich for. Uh, discussion and, and questions. So, uh, so please, um, questions, comments. JB in the back. Thank you. 
Prussian male Canadian diplomat, a point of reference. And was there a reference to Catherine the Great? Did she have a mm. person to think about? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, to compare uh, Austria or to the imperial court to the French court is, of course, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's very common. And it is obvious that the uh, French court was much more open to spectators, to, to uh, common people than was the, Austrian, uh, the imperial court. We couldn't say Austrian court because it was um, the court of the Holy Roman Empire, at least most of the time. So uh, this is, I think, the most obvious uh, difference between the two courts, yeah? the general access to, uh, for everyone who was uh, clean and wore clean clothes and so on. And uh, you can see this from the letters of Marie Antoinette to her mother who when she was uh, when she arrived in France, and she told her mother completely different here uh, uh, regarding access to the court. Everyone uh, is, is yeah, it's crowded, and everyone is uh, uh, has access to um, to the palace. Um, and the other obvious difference is, of course, that uh, Enlightenment and the Enlightened public played a completely different role in France, and that the Austrian men were. Um, I mean, uh, it was, were, were mu there was much less of a yeah, public sphere in the Austrian land, also compared, for example, to other German territories like uh, Hamburg or cities like Hamburg, Leipzig, and so on. So uh, there were almost no, or there were no critical papers in, on journals in uh, Austria up to uh, Sonnenfeld was the first one to, to, to publish a uh, moral weekly, so to speak, in, in Austria. And everything was uh, controlled by the court until, I would say, the 1770s. So uh, there was the, the most important journals were controlled by the court. Um, so these are the most obvious differences between the two and the way the, um, the, the, the picture of the monarch was controllable in, in Imperial court in contrast to the French one. Um, <coughs> your presentation stressed uh, the features uh, in the development of the of the mythos or the topos of, of the Empress Queen and her accessibility to the subjects uh, that were specific to her time and place, to her gender character of the state as she transformed it uh, uh, to, to her context. And, and it's, it's very persuasive. Uh, but what you didn't mention was the extent to which she inherited earlier myths, earlier topoi of the accessibility of this semi-sacred sovereign figure, uh, the father, not mother, uh, of the people, mm -hmm. the protector of the Catholic faith, mm -hmm. uh, the, the champion against the Turks, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the one with the securing scrofula in all public audiences, and she wasn't and able to. She wasn't, no. yeah, all right. Well, the question <laughs> is, my question is, mm -hmm. what things did she take advantage of in that inheritance? Or was she really deliberate about uh, uh, stamping out yeah. Uh, yeah. the previous yeah. uh, imagery? Yeah. I, um, she was deeply indebted to tradition. I, I just want to say I forgot to answer the question uh, referring to Catherine the Great. I will uh, uh, do that later. Uh, so yes, I would say you can't understand Maria Theresa without her, her uh, deep indebtedness to the tradition, and the tradition in many respects, the tradition of the Catholic Church, the tradition of the imperial court, and the tradition of the uh, Habsburg dynasty. So, uh, and you can only understand her incredible self-confidence uh, if you take these long traditions into account. And she was educated in this, uh, in the consciousness of this, these traditions, and you can see that I, um, found in the archive in the Haushofer Staatsarchiv the uh, papers of uh, her and her sister when they were little children and how which questions they were asked in history. 
And if, if how they answered the question, and they had to learn that by heart, obviously. And so it, it is uh, interesting to see that she was raised in the consciousness that she inherited uh, the Roman Empire that dated back to not only Charlemagne, but uh, uh, Augustus, uh, Caesar and Augustus, and so on. So um, you, yeah, and, and this, uh, these, these long traditions were, um, were performed again and again in the huge rituals of uh, sovereignty at the time. And so they kept this consciousness alive. Um, I would say, um, yeah, the tradition is absolutely crucial to understand her uh, personal way of uh, perceiving her task and, uh, and so on. But um, regarding her myth, uh, in contrast to her, her predecessors, she uh, is the one who was uh, considered by historians of the 19th century as the one who is accessible to everyone. This is, yeah, uh, this was, uh, she was considered to be exceptional and I wanted to show that this is not the case. She's much more uh, similar to her predecessors. She's even uh, less explicitly less explicit. And um, referring to Catherine uh, the Great, um, contemporaries, as far as I know, um, didn't compare her the, the, the two of them. But um, of course, uh, she was compared to Elizabeth uh, and uh, to. Madame de Pompadour. So these were the three whores, uh, yeah, the three whores uh, as uh, enemies of Frederick the Great, and uh, they were um, put into a line with one another um, by Frederick the Great himself in his in his uh, uh, satirical uh, writing. So, um, but the historians and also the uh, contemporaries in her own land, of course, um, uh, drew no parallel. Especially Maria Theresia's uh, virtue or the sexual uh, virtue that impeccable uh, sexual uh, virtue that was praised by contemporaries. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question that sort of picks up on the last two, and I was just wondering about was, I mean, was a bit of an imitation to, <coughs> of what the Prussian had uh, uh, shown at, at birth. And many other uh, territories uh, were much further in this process, and she, uh, she uh, um, imitated this in a way and tr transferred these kind of reforms to her land. And they were, uh, in, in many respects, much more traditional, much less modernize and all that than other territories of the time. And uh, I wouldn't say that this has any to, anything to do with her being a woman. I would indeed say that um, many of her features, also her way to wage war against her enemies, had nothing to do with her sex being a woman. Um, and she, she always stressed that it was uh, a problem for her to be a woman, to be always pregnant and so on. And that was, uh, yeah, I think she, she, uh, she found this um, impeded her in, in her uh, business of uh, sovereignty. So um, I think uh, she, she didn't like to be a woman. She expressed several times that she herself uh, didn't like it. And, and I wouldn't, and also the historians didn't link the reforms, with the exception of Ruf and Hofmannsthal, of course. Uh, where you can see that uh, reforms are um, uh, depicted as a yeah, act of giving birth to the state. Yeah. In this respect, we might draw the parallel to uh, gender. Because it's worth the long day, but just worth the Yeah, 
and she couldn't uh, be her own um, uh, head count. Um, general. Her own general. It was yeah, the, the big disadvantage, and she, she complained about this disadvantage all the time. Didn't her granddaughter marry Napoleon? Or was it a great granddaughter? Great granddaughter. Great granddaughter. Great granddaughter. Great granddaughter. Mm -hmm. great granddaughter. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yes. I would like to give you a present. <laughs> I have, have this pendant with Maria Theresia's <laughs> pictures on it. Have you uh, seen it? I, I, I don't know where it comes from. Yeah. Probably from one of my numerous trips to Germany over the years. And it's a souvenir probably from a museum. Yeah. May yeah. I bestow no, it? <laughs> 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 Why don't we just, just place it down here? I can't, I can't accept it. I mean, we, we talked about that because uh, Marilyn is wearing it as well. <laughs> oh. This is from Maria Theresienthaler. Interesting. Yes. It's legal tender in America up to 1857. Yeah, I, it, it is. Uh, in many respects, it is uh, unique because I mean, it, it, <laughs> this one is of course not unique. There are oh, thousands of copies where? because it was uh, a. Um, you call it, I'd call it, that, uh, it was used in uh, the the, uh, the Middle East until uh, late in the, in the 19th century. So it, it was uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I'd so, like to talk with you. <laughs> and I, I already told but uh, please, Howard that you can give it on to a student. <laughs> I, I mean, it's a precious. I was I was actually uh, given it when I was a child. <laughs> uh, when I was eight, uh, it was, I was given it as a present, and it was stolen some years ago with all oh. my all my jewelry. And so well, so uh, I, I I know it, and I like it. And so, uh, but it is too precious to keep. I, you are the perfect <laughs> person to get it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Yeah. Uh, further questions, <laughs> comments? The word dollar made into it. Right, right. Uh, no, no, no. Okay, I think without any further ado, why don't we um, thank again Professor Stolberg-Willinger. We have some reciprocal refreshments.